For 10 years, I was a firefighter in the United States Air Force. I saved countless lives from all over the world. And that makes me a bit of an expert on all things firefighting. And that's why today, you and I are going to watch Season 1, Episode 1 of Rescue Me. This is Episode 1 of An Old School Firefighter Reacts. So before we start watching the episode, I want to give a quick overview of my actual firefighting experience. As I said, I was an Air Force firefighter and I did it for 10 years. I received my training at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. That is the most advanced fire school on the planet. Altogether, my initial firefighting certifications cost around $100,000. And that's because I got a ton of them right out the gate. And by the 10th year of my firefighting career in the Air Force, I received the following certifications. Fire Officer 1, EMT, Airport Rescue Firefighting, Structural Firefighting, Hazardous Materials Technician, Pumping Apparatus Operator, Aerial Apparatus Operator, Airport Rescue Firefighting Vehicle Operator, Wildland Firefighting, Fire Inspector, Arson Investigator, Technical Rescue, Confined Space Rescue, 911 Dispatch Level 2 and a whole bunch more that I can't remember right now because there were a lot. All my certifications came from the DOD, AKA the Department of Defense, and more importantly, IFSTA. IFSTA is the International Fire Service Training Association. Things have obviously changed a bit since then. They were probably a lot more streamlined, the vehicles have gotten better, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I'm calling this an old school firefighter reacts. Now a lot of things might have changed since then, but one thing that will never change is the courage of the men and women who run into buildings to slay that red dragon when everybody else is running out. So I just want to give a big shout out to any current, prior, and future firefighters who may be watching this from anywhere around the world. And of course, a big shout out to all the military firefighters, especially you Air Force fire dogs watching this show right now. All that being said, it's time to watch Season 1, Episode 1 of Rescue Me. And remember, if there are other firefighter movies or shows you guys want me to watch, let me know in the comment section below. Now most of the time when you see smoke that is this clean in firefighter shows and movies and there's nothing around there burning, it's from a smoke machine that's off to the side. It's basically the same stuff that they use in rock concerts and things like that. We actually use this type of smoke machine in the fire service for training. And what's cool is you can actually order different flavors of smoke. And when I say different flavors, I mean it. It doesn't just smell like a certain thing, it also tastes a little bit like it. So there's pina colada, there's vanilla, there's chocolate, there's all kinds of stuff. There's cherry. The default smoke basically smells exactly like a big fat ass vape cloud. Except you won't find any douchebags sitting around smoking shisha trying to blow smoke rings into smoke rings. You wanna know how big my balls are? My balls are bigger than two of your heads duct taped together. I've been in the middle of shit that would make you piss your pants right now. Uptown, downtown, Harlem, Brooklyn. But there ain't no medals on my chest, assholes. Because I ain't no hero. I'm a fireman. We're not in the business of making heroes here. We're in the business of discovering cowards. Because that's what you are if you can't take the heat. You're a pussy. And there ain't no room for pussies in the FDNY. And that's actually pretty true. That goes for all fire services. Now, New York tends to be one of the busiest fire services in the world. But... Even in the Air Force, when we had new firefighters, they were trained up very well. But you still have to teach them a lot of things. They might know the, the book stuff and they have done some training exercises and stuff like that to get the certifications. But they still can make a lot of dumb mistakes because they're nervous or because they're inexperienced. And that's why we tend to start them off a bit easy. We give them a bunch of exercises, then we put them on the tailboard. That's the people who sit in the back. So when we pull up to the fire ground, they jump off the truck, they connect that large intake hose to the fire hydrant, they wait for the driver to tell them it's okay to turn it on, and then they run up and they start helping us. You pussies better pray you don't get assigned to my firehouse because I have seen it all. I knew 60 men gave their lives at ground zero. 60. Four of them from my house. Now, obviously, this show is fictionalized. 
a lot of the scenarios are going to be based off of, you know, actual firefighters and things that they talked about, you know, when they were writing the script and stuff. But what he's talking about right now is Ground Zero 9-11 and the 343 firefighters who gave their lives trying to get everyone out of those buildings. Ricky Davis found him almost whole, hugging a civilian woman. Bobby Vincent found his head. And my cousin, Jimmy Keefe. My best friend. You know what they found to him? What I was able to bring back, give to his parents? A finger. That's all. A finger. And what he's talking about is very true. You know, there was such an impact from the collapse of those buildings. All that weight came down onto all those people and just smashed them to pieces. Not only that, you know, you had all of the fire and the heat and everything that was just cooking in that rubble for days and days and days. So a lot of firefighters, their bodies were never recovered, their gear wasn't recovered, they were just disintegrated, basically. And what sucks even more is all the other firefighters, you know, paramedics, the cops, everybody who came after and was working at Ground Zero, the vast majority of them now have respiratory issues, a lot of them got lung cancer, and pretty much everybody who wasn't with FDNY or NYPD who came and just did it out of the goodness of their heart, they didn't get health insurance, they didn't get benefits, so a lot of them ended up dying because they couldn't afford treatment. These four men were better human beings and better firefighters than any of you will ever be. Say thank you, firefighting upper class! Thank you, firefighter captain, sir! <laughs> Those probies wouldn't think you were such a tough guy if they knew you were talking to a dead guy, but... Alright, so this is obviously a representation of post-traumatic stress. I myself have PTSD from a lot of the stuff that I dealt with when I was a firefighter. But I don't go around seeing people that I couldn't save or patients that didn't make it. But it is an interesting way to show what he's dealing with on the inside. Hey, Tommy. Hey. You know, we get our new probie tonight. You know what that means. Time to bust some balls, baby. Well, you know what? <laughs> I should do the first gag. If the city sends one of those shrinks over here, I'm going to tell him Chief Paroli touched me in the shower. That'll fix the bastard. What are you talking about, shrinks? Yeah, my buddy Victor over at Engine 2. So yeah. the city sent a shrink over to his house to talk to the guys. So they said they're getting a probie, which means a new firefighter in. And the thing about being a probie when you're a firefighter, and it doesn't matter if it's Air Force, if it's civilian, anything, you're going to get messed with a lot. They're going to do a lot of pranks to you, and it's going to be really awkward. It's going to be fun for everybody else, not fun for you. And the second thing is when he mentioned that they're sending psychologists to the different firehouses. That's also very true. Whenever you have a big traumatic emergency where maybe some people got hurt or some people died or it was just an emotionally taxing situation, you and everybody else who was involved with that fire scene will have to go through Chris counseling. And that's basically crisis intervention counseling and evaluation. And they're just trying to see if you're okay, you know, if you could use some help and if you're fit to keep on firefighting. She shuns me. She shuns you. Blows me off, leaves in a huff. You believe this shit? What I can't believe is you making a move on a chick with sideburns. Hey, Tommy, it's getting slow out there, pal. All that pussy I was getting after 9-11, now nothing. People forget. <laughs> yeah, sad commentary. So one thing you're probably gonna see a lot of in this show and in real firefighters, real paramedics, and real cops is uh, gallows humor. Gallows humor is our way of trying to deal with stressful situations or really bad shit that happened to you. So in this case, even though this guy lost 60 of his friends in 9-11, him and the other guy, Franco, can still make jokes about what happened. They're going to be really dark and twisted jokes, and that will offend a lot of people, but it's their way of coping with what happened. And that's all that gallows humor is. It's a coping mechanism. What's going on? Nothing. What happened? Nothing. It's the onions. I'm helping the probie make his first meal. Jesus Christ, this is what they send us? you got to be kidding me. What's your name? Mike. You asking me or telling me? Well, it's Mike. There's too many Mikes around here. Polish Mike, Irish Mike. Mike the Mick. Big Mike, little Mike. Hey, you Jewish? No, why? Then you can be Mike the Kike. I'm Italian. Forget it, there's already a guinea Mike over at Ladder 12. Oh. Not to mention Mike the Wop over in the Upper East Side. You know what, screw it. New Mike. New Mike it is. What if I'm here for like 10 years? Well, I don't think that's gonna be a problem, kid, okay? Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so like I said, when you're a probie, they really, really mess with you. Uh, and your nickname that you get when you first get there it pretty much sticks with you through your whole career. My first station was at Kunsan, South Korea, and by the end of my tour, my nickname was Freak Boy or Freak because well, I can't really get into it, but there was a lot of stuff that happened, a lot of things that I did that got me that nickname. 
What's with the coffee? No cream, no sugar? Come on. Engine. Automated system. And they had to make it a woman's voice. Ladder. Politically correct bullshit. Italian. <sighs> move, asshole, move. That voice is the closest thing I'm ever going to come to working with abroad. And that was actually true as well for a while. Uh, you didn't find a lot of female firefighters in the service, at least in the city and that kind of stuff, even in the military. But when I went through the fire school, we had a ton of female firefighters come through. And one of them, her name was Kagozi. She was so much stronger than me and a lot of the other guys with her upper body strength, you know. Not only did we have to do our firefighter training, but we also had an obstacle course that we had to run like once every two weeks. And she was the best at it. She was so fast. And when she would climb the rope at the end, she would use just her arms. And I'll be honest, I've never been good at climbing ropes. I couldn't even get halfway. And she went all the way up and all the way down. And then to make me look stupid in front of the guy, she went all the way back up and all the way back down again. God damn. She major piece of ass candy on the northeast corner. Possible Bo Derrick on the northeast corner. That's more like Heidi Klum. <laughs> that was Heidi Klum. That would definitely happen. When you're on your way to the fire scene, when you first head out, you talk about what the thing is, what might happen, what might be there. You kind of get in the zone for it. But that only takes a little bit of time, and sometimes it takes a few minutes to get there. So if you happen to pass uh, a woman, or you know, if you're a lady, if you pass a guy that you think is good looking, you might say something to your firefighter friends. One time we were going to a fire scene, and there were two cars in the intersection in front of us, and we had to go left. And this is when I was the driver. And the front guy wouldn't back up, so I couldn't make my turn. So I beat my horn, which is this tremendously loud horn, and it freaked him out. He hit the gas, and he went reverse right into the front of the car behind him. <laughs> Myself and everybody else on the truck laughed our asses off and kept going because... It was like, you know, a fender bender, nobody got hurt. Plus, we had a fire to get to and people to rescue. That's Jesus. awful. What is that? It's piss. It's a river of piss. Jesus. So, there's no fire? You can start one if you want. I guess we gotta go up, huh? Yeah, Let's shoot the rapids. So the thing about being a firefighter is you don't actually go to as many fires as people would think. You go to a lot of rescues, you go to a lot of false alarms, you go to things like this, uh, just really weird calls where you have to help people or someone made a call, they didn't really know who they should be contacting and they send the fire department. I even went on a call once in North Dakota where I had to rescue a bird from a tree. I'm not joking, I had to rescue the family bird out of a tree. It was a cockatiel and its wings were clipped. I guess it only had enough juice to get up into the tree and then it couldn't fly off. So. We had to bring the ladder out, put it up in the tree, and then I had to try to get the bird down. I got 15 to 20 large jars of piss someone dumped down the stairs. Are we talking about human piss? Hey, kid, taste that piss and tell me if it's human. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Nothing. Oh, well, you got that down, oh, goddamn science. Get your greasy Puerto Rican ass over your side to help the chief. <laughs> Garrity, yeah. Can you thick make fingers over that engine up and take in the line? You guys are probably thinking that this is really exaggerated, that people don't talk like this anymore. When it comes to the fire department, we definitely talk like this. All the time, about everybody in every way that you can think of. Uh, the firefighters are basically shit talking 24 seven. If we're not sleeping, we're talking shit to our friends. You were sober for what, a year? 14 months to be exact. Cheers. No, come on, what are you doing? Don't do this. Come on. Now, because firefighting is so stressful, a lot of people will go overboard with different vices. You'll find a lot of people who are addicted to sex, who are addicted to alcohol, who are addicted to gambling. Uh, when it comes to firefighting, you're not gonna find too many people who are addicted to drugs. Uh, there will be some, but most of them tend to fear for their jobs, so they tend to stay away from that, and they tend to head towards the booze. So how much? Scale of 10, 25. No, 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 tell me details, many details. <laughs> okay, one of the things that firefighters, not just guys too, because we had a female firefighter named Christy who used to talk so much shit. About 75% of the time, whatever we're talking about, it doesn't matter what the topic is, it's complete bullshit, and it's just us having fun. Bob? Where's Jimmy, man? What happened? Shit. Tommy, I 
can't feel my legs. Now again, that is something that will happen. Uh, you will remember certain tragic situations that you've been in, you know, certain calls that you were on, you know, you'll hear certain sounds and they'll just make you remember something that happened, usually bad, when you were firefighting. What? She said 4B, it should be the other end of the hall. I had a call here once, Paul's right. mom. Small kitchen in the front, living room, bedroom in the back. Here's the thing, even if you've been to some place before, you should always be ready to fight fire or to perform a rescue because you never know what might happen. There was one time, uh, my crew and I, in Masawa, Japan again, we had to go to this high rise and we always got false alarms at this high rise because of the firefighting sprinkler system. So we had a call on the ninth floor of the building. We went up there with our hose packs, with all of our gear like we should, and we were expecting to find nothing. So I unlocked the door, I opened it, and fire just rolled out of the apartment over our heads. I shut the door really fast, I called it in, and I had my crew member run down the stairs and connect to the pipe system in the stairwell. And then I called my driver, I told him to send the water up, and then we started fighting that fire. Now, one thing I want to touch on here is the SCBA, or self-contained breathing apparatus. You'll know it because it's just like scuba self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. It's the air pack that firefighters wear when they go in to fight fires. These guys are waiting till the very last moment. They're walking through smoke and everything, and they're waiting till they get to the apartment. Nowadays, if you go into a building and there's smoke, even if it's not heavy, you put on your pack, you put on your mask, you turn your oxygen on because that fire might not be out of control and you might not have a lot of smoke, but there could be carcinogens in that smoke from all of the chemicals and the plastics and everything that you find in houses and in businesses these days. Any kind of smoke, you wear your air pack. Now you see right there he had to stop and put his helmet on. Your helmet should be secured to your head with the strap and all that kind of stuff. So that's not really that accurate. But if you see, they went into the room and immediately he started going right. That is very accurate. We do what we call a right-handed search pattern. So if you go into a house or a room or whatever and it's filled with smoke and you can't see very well, what happens is you put your hand on that right wall, you put your left hand out and you start crawling and you're sitting there feeling for any bodies, anything that might get in the way if you're trying to get through and you go all the way around on the right hand side of that room and you just work your way around till you get to the end of the apartment or the house or that building or whatever. While you're doing that right handed search pattern, your crew member will grab onto your bunker pants and they'll extend out too so that you guys can double the area that you're able to search in any given room. And that's why there's primary search, there's secondary search. Come here. I told you to stay close, asshole. Come on. So you see, he's in the room and the probie can't find him. Why is that? Because the probie's not holding on to his pant leg while they're doing the search. Now maybe they don't do that in FDNY, but I know in the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, the Marines, everyone in the Department of Defense, all the firefighters do that. Pull my arm. What? Pull my arm. Go! Move! That right there is super accurate. When you're doing your search patterns, you always want to check closets, under beds, and bathtubs in cabinets, everywhere that a kid might hide because kids, they'll get scared and they'll go straight away to hide under something because they want to feel safe. And that's why you find in a lot of fires, uh, kids who died from smoke inhalation or from the heat, they were cut off and you couldn't get to them in time, things like that. I didn't deal with that too many times, thankfully. Most of the kids that I dealt with who passed were for other reasons. How we doing boys? Place is empty, Chief. Primary search negative. Great. Start the secondary floor by floor, right, Billy? 10 4. See? Primary, secondary search. I still remember, baby. Oh, oh, oh. Easy, man. 
man. Take it easy. <laughs> now, this is obviously for humor and shock value and stuff like that, but it's not unrealistic. A lot of times, you will go into some place that's supposed to have been cleared out, and you'll find somebody who is really stressed out, they're freaking out, and they are not cooperative, and you might have to take them out yourselves or have the cops come in and do it for you. I'm losing on everything here. The over, first downs, interception, sacks, they're killing me. You better know that stuff. That's some serious gambling. Like I said, alcoholism, gambling, sex, food. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Hey, I thought you said the building was clear, Bill. It is. Everyone's accounted for. Oh, no, wait, wait! <laughs> Damn it, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, gallows humor. Super dark, super offensive to many people, but it's kind of what we did to deal with the stress. Hey, Proby, you know there's an old saying in the FDNY, if you ain't scared, you're crazy. You got some puke on your chest. Thanks. No matter how brave you are, how good you are at your job, you know your shit, and when you're going into that fire, you're confident, you're still always a bit nervous, and you're still always weary of stuff that might go wrong. You have to watch that fire. You have to always be analyzing the fire because it can change at any second. And if you're not paying attention, you could be dead or seriously hurt. Got 50 on the line. The line's My aim is to match. Are we betting on the food chain now? Yeah, you want in? This is pretty common. You're definitely gonna see this in the firehouse. Most of the time, you have you know, a TV in the kitchen or whatever, but you'll have a separate area that we call the day room. And the day room is kind of like the living room for the fire department. You'll go into the day room, you'll put on your show, your movie, wrestling, whatever it is that you guys are watching. Normally you take turns, somebody will pick something, or you know, if there's a certain night, everybody watches something like every week. And you'll also see a lot of firefighters at the kitchen table together, whether they be cooking, eating, playing cards, or just bullshitting. Guys, this is Dr. Goldberg, she's a uh, shrink. Actually, I'm a psychotherapist. So, I'm uh, here to help if anyone would like to talk. But uh, we don't have to talk to you if we don't want to, right? No, you don't, but... Uh, some people might not want to, but more often than not, when you do talk, you're going to talk with your fellow firefighters. You're going to help each other out to help get over things that have happened. Now, something like 9-11, that's on a whole nother level. So you definitely are probably gonna need some type of counseling. You don't seem to think that a woman can be a firefighter. I tell you what, it's not about being a man or a woman, okay? It's about doing the job. It's about me getting home safe and sound in the morning to see my kids, okay? So, you got a woman who can do the job better than the guys in my crew? Bring her on. The fire department is very forward thinking. That's why we don't get upset when we sit there and we make jokes about each other's gender or whatever. Uh, you know, your ethnic descent, we did it all the time, nobody cared. You know, it's a whole different environment. But it's like he said, if a woman can do the job just as well or better, then fine. Let her do her thing. We don't care. Black kid, 10 years old. Pulled him out of a closet. Hot fire all around. He's burnt. He's scared. And he's uh, he's slipping and sliding around in my arms like a like a goddamn baby seal. The reason he said that the kid was slipping and sliding in his arms like a baby seal is because when you pick up a body that's burnt, uh, depending on the thickness of the burn, the skin comes off, and then you're left with blood and muscle, and it's slippery. Uh, if they have full thickness burns, you know third degree burns, and you go to pick them up. A lot of times, everything will come off. You don't really have a choice. You know, you got to get them out of there, try to save them. Here I go. I'm thinking about uh, a call that I had. We'll get to it another time. Best goddamn fireman I ever worked with. Good family man. Dedicated American, blah, blah, blah. You know, and every day I got to drive to work. I drive through my neighborhood. I see guys, drunken assholes that I went to high school with who are standing on the corner, high, having a great time. And I got to wonder why. These assholes are still walking around. See, he's not just talking about the people around the neighborhood that he sees. He's talking about himself. Sometimes you go to scenes and people get hurt, people die, and then you get survivor's guilt. It's part of the job. It sucks. It really fucking sucks, but you got to deal with it. So you talk to people like he's doing, you know, you do your gallows humor, you do whatever you have to do. Bones sinking like stones, all that we fall for. 
here's one thing that's always confused me about the fire department in New York at DNY, right? The way it works when you're a firefighter in the military is you have 24 hours on, 24 hours off, right? So every other day you're at work. So you come in at like seven in the morning, you know, you clean your trucks, then you do your training, then you work out, then you clean up, then you have dinner, then you go to bed. And then the next morning, 7 a.m., you go home and the other shift comes on. And that's how it is. And every two weeks, you get a day off, you know. So one of your every other days you would have been working is gone. And that's called a Kelly day. So basically every two weeks, you get a weekend. I don't understand how the FDNY shifts work because they, they call their shifts tours. I don't understand how their tours work because he's on his tour, but now he's going home. So when do they start? When do they finish? Is it individual people? If you are a firefighter from New York or LA or anywhere and you're watching this, please let me know in the comment sections below how your schedule works so I can wrap my mind around this. Everybody here's got somebody to So those are the ghosts of his past, you know, the stuff that's happened to him as a firefighter that are following him around. Now, like I said, you're not obviously going to be seeing them, but you're definitely going to see them in your mind's eye all the time. Uh, when he was talking about the kid uh, picking him up and he, you know, his skin came off and he dropped him, that actually happened to me. But it was uh, a Korean soldier when I was in South Korea. Myself and another guy went to pick him up. And uh, he was so badly burned that his flesh just came off and he fell to the floor. And uh, he was begging us in Korean, I found out after, to let him die. And then later on, when we were bringing him outside, he was begging us to kill him. And then our proby threw a wool blanket on top of him. And uh, a wool blanket, obviously, all those fibers come off. And so now not only is he having to get scrubbed down for the burns and the dead skin, they're going to have to get all those goddamn wool fibers out of his flesh because this kid made that stupid decision. So those are the things that you think about. That's the stuff that, that, that goes on in your head. And that's just like one call, right? You know, you're getting three, four, five calls a day. A lot of stuff sticks with you. So if you see a firefighter, a cop, or a paramedic, no matter what the climate is in America right now, thank them. Because they're out there every day, every night, risking their lives and, and dealing with all the stress and trauma to save you, to help you. That really turned dark really fast. So let's try to get it back to positivity. Uh, so that was episode one of an old school firefighter react. So that was Rescue Me season one, episode one. If there are any firefighter shows or movies that you'd like me to watch, and react to and talk about, let me know in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and uh, it's definitely just the first. And remember, thank a firefighter, thank a police officer, thank a paramedic, thank a soldier, because they're out there risking their ass to save yours. Bye.